Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk, the High Line, Gantz of Wood Market District, the Whitney. It's the largest commercial art gallery neighborhood in the world. It's hip, it's hot, it's happening. It's New York City's latest frontier. It's the far west side of Manhattan and the subject of David Halley and Elizabeth Tiso's New York's New Edge, Contemporary Art, The High Line, and Urban Mega Projects on the Far West Side. David is professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and an adjunct professor at the CUNY Graduate Center and the School of Professional Studies. He is the author of America's Working Man and Inside Culture. Elizabeth is an art historian who has taught at Parsons, Fordham, UCLA. She's published reviews and articles on contemporary art and architecture in Art in America, Art News Magazine, and Parole Gele, and other academic publications. Welcome to the both of you. Thank I got you. through that friend, not, not too bad for a guy from uh, Brooklyn. Okay, <laughs> Far West Side, what are we talking about? It, uh, reading the book, it's seems to be both a material place and a metaphor. What is it? It's uh, both, and what it is is a metaphor and material place for New York at its best. New York has always been the home to what's new and innovative, and the Far West Side is the latest incarnation of that. There are three major developments in the Far West Side which we wrote about in the book. Uh, the first is the way Chelsea became the largest commercial art gallery district in the world, and it happened incredibly quickly. And second of all, two really iconic, quote-unquote, preservation projects, the High Line and the Gansevoort Market Historic District. And then thirdly, a series of mega projects, including uh, Penn Station, the Hudson Yards, some of which worked, most of which didn't. But the three together and are really And the stadia and the extension of the Javits Center as That's well. Right. That's right. Elizabeth, how did you come to write this book? What attracted you, both of you, to the far west side. Well, I've lived in the neighborhood since the 1990s in the West Village. Wow, and a different I was time. Go ahead. Very different time. And I was really struck by the enormous development that was taking place rapidly. And being an art historian, I was also interested in Chelsea. I went to um, the Dia Art Foundation, a nonprofit that had moved there in 1987 to their opening and was just taken by that area. And then Matthew Marks moving there from Soho and how that neighborhood developed so quickly. Um, and the other, other pieces of the puzzle, of course, the Gansevoort Market, the High Line, of course. Um, so you were there? I was there. How was did you there. get involved? You've, you two have worked together in the past, but yeah. what attracted you other than that it was a, Elizabeth was interested in it? Or well, vice versa. We, we did work together in the past. I wrote a book, Inside Culture, which was about the art that people have in their houses in New York, and Elizabeth helped me with the research. And uh, when Elizabeth told me that all the art gallery districts were, um, all, all, all the art galleries were moving to Chelsea, I said, gee, we'd better look at this. And so we took a look at it, and uh, we discovered this incredibly interesting phenomenon of a huge rush of art galleries from Soho to Chelsea. And then we realized there was a lot of other stuff going on, like the High Line and the mm -hmm. Transport Market and the mega projects, and we figured we'd better write about the whole thing. Yeah, and one of the things that's really fascinating about the book is the way your, you know, in-depth, interrelated case studies really get at cause and effect, and, and in a sense you get lost in it because it's so complex. What, what attracted you to the approach? Why did you use this particular sort of narrative, in-depth approach to get at, at, we'll talk about what you got at and, and what your findings are. How well, did that work? It, it makes it more interesting if you make it sort of a personal narrative and, and address all the different um, individuals, New Yorkers, activists, that, that caused many of these projects to come about. David Hammonds um, and, and uh, sorry, Josh Davids and, and David Hammonds. 
Robert Hammonds and Josh David, sorry, and Joe Hamilton and Francois Morellet and, and how the whole thing evolved, Amanda Burden, Bloomberg. Um, it becomes a very interesting New York this story. This is a mini, mini series almost. I mean, you've got some of the key players in the game. You've got the stakes of the game. You've got the strategies. I mean, come on, forget about, you know, writing, you know, really well-researched, you know, academic stuff. Screenplay. Go ahead. But, but, but also, as, as a sociologist and social scientist, I figured uh, case studies are really the only way to get a, a, away from a lot of misconceptions about these phenomena. So, for example, yeah. the uh, art, it, there's, a, there's a misconception around these days that art is all about money. Uh, we argue in the book that there's two stories to tell mm. about art. Uh, the first story is about rents and uh, money and so on and so forth. The second story is the story about what the art means to people who actually like yep. it both those who um, are going to buy it and those who just look. And we argue that has nothing to do with money at all. We argue that has to do, when you ask people about why they like a particular work of art, which no one ever does, uh, it has to do with that art in some way resonating with someone's life in a trivial way or in a serious way. But that's why people, we discover that's our theory of art and that's the second story we tell of art. Uh, that's why people, uh, we argue, like art. And based the, on our interviews. And one of the great quotes from the book we think was given to us by the, the gallerist Barbara Gladstone, that Chelsea provides the best free show in town. You can see museum quality exhibitions for free. Um, so it's really open to all. And, and Much you've got the highlight, you've got everything yeah, in this street life. It's really a remarkable transformation. Okay, so you're researching, uh, researching and writing the book. An aha moment where you go, Wow, this, you know, something that just made you smile and put pieces together. Anybody? Uh, for me, the aha m m moment, and again, I'm, uh, I'm a socialist. I was worried. I mean, I, we saw all these interesting phenomena that didn't seem to be related to each other. The art, the uh, highline, the mega projects, and it was so interesting. We had to write about it, but my aha moment was I see intellectually how it all fits together. And intellectually, for me, it all fits together because the Bloomberg administration uh, basically um, was trying to balance growth and preservation. Which is the key, key issue in land use in New York and, and, and globally, in fact. Absolutely. And um, the, the way they started to do it, and they just stumbled into this, because Bloomberg was elected, we tend to forget, he was elected right after 9-11. And the reason he was elected was because uh, the voters figured that um, we, we need someone from the business world sure. to bring us back from this economic precipice. He was elected to, uh, to get growth, but uh, he was also trying to operate in a city where people are quite concerned about preservation. So what they came up with the Bloomberg administration is we'll do growth, we'll do the mega projects, but we'll also create historic districts. And under Bloomberg, um, and Landmarks Commissioner Tierney, they created 41 historic mm. districts, more than any other mayor has And they returned 37 to 40, whatever it 40 is, 40 percent of the city and Absolutely. much of Manhattan. So the, what your book points out is that it, it, there's this complex array of players and, and there's a lot of luck and forces well beyond anybody's control. Let's look at, let's look at the Chelsea uh, case as an example. Chelsea becomes the hottest, largest commercial contemporary art district in the world. In the world. First of all, what is contemporary art, which you talk about, and what is a, dis, uh, you know, a commercial art district? What are we talking about here? Well, contemporary art is any artist born, basically, in the, the post-war period, um, and... Wow, that makes me feel good. That's, feel that, I'm a contemporary something or other. And con the commercial art gallery, of course, area is art being sold for profit, technically. Um, now, the neighborhood started by a group of gallerist, Matthew Marks in particular, who moved, couldn't find a reasonable space. Where? In Soho. He was, okay. in, the, he was in the Upper East Side. So he moved to Soho, and then he moved in 94 to Chelsea. Okay, so there's a dynamic that's going on in that yes. particular situation. What's the dynamic? Well, the dynamic is different than that that was there previously. Previously, neighborhoods like the Lower East Side and really Soho started by artists themselves, manufacturing areas. Right. Soho was sort of different in that it was a commercial gallery area from the beginning. 
what also differentiated it is that Matthew Marks bought his space. He, he found a garage and humorously, as we tell in the book, he bought it, what was a dilapidated garage in a dilapidated area because there was nothing there really. Right. Um, and so the galleries have really buffered themselves from a lot of the problems that befell Soho and the Lower East Side, and that they've insulated themselves. Later, Paula Cooper bought her space, Gagosian moved in. So um, it became ownership rather than rental. Yes. But then, but this is a precipitant, and all of a sudden, and it looks like all of a sudden, that within the space of relatively few years, this booms. Now, clearly, the high line, the rezonings, all of these have an interactive yes. effect, but how do we get there? What was it? Well, there's, um, the, the, what's very interesting about contemporary art is that uh, it ended up taking place in what's the most effusive uh, market for art in the history of the world. That the, the art market really took off. I mean, of course, it's had ups and downs, but the art market really took off. And, and that was a, a Took off in what sense? Took off as... as um, globalized? Yes, yes. Econ and, 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 economically, economically. Economically, contemporary art now is one of the largest as a, an areas. economic interest. Uh, Christie sold close to, you know, 900,000, 900 million dollars in one night. It's a huge um, okay. economic... But, it's um, surpassed it, Impressionism and, uh, as a collector's... Um, yeah, that was pretty fascinating to somebody who's not an expert at all into the, the, the economics of, of the business. How, why, why Chelsea again, though? Why Chelsea? Uh, well, it provided uh, a lot of empty what? space. Okay, so you need raw space. space. And you don't have residents. No, you have no residents. Which is important because you don't have local opposition. So the political, th there's got to be the, you know, almost a perfect storm. If one goes back to the genesis, of course, of course, Nonprofits moved in. The, um, the Kitchen and the Dia Foundation moved out of Soho because they were having economic problems. There was um, um, better business to sell their spaces and move into Chelsea. And also they found the, the high-end high clothing stores. As you point out, there were different types of development and commercial. this commercialization, you know, this, this upscale clothing driving out. I mean, just the dynamics are really quite fascinating, and they move rapidly. I'm sorry. They, they, they are, and um, one of the things we uh, are quite careful to do is to distinguish uh, different types of gentrification. Gentrification is a word that's thrown around a lot. Yeah, and a lot like of critical. conflation of meaning. Go ahead. Yeah, there is, yeah. and what we argued is that uh, you really need to distinguish, based on what we saw going on in uh, the Far West Side, three kinds of gentrification and you can value them differently. The first kind is what's called the classic gentrification, which happened in London a long time ago. And with the Lots gate, of gate, neighborhoods and, in New York. Go ahead. Right, and the classic gentrification is where you take a working class uh, or poor residential neighborhood, and then the middle class tend to move in. Now, that wasn't the far west side, because most of the areas that we were talking about were originally manufacturing. Sure. And people living there. Sure. It is the lower east side, but it's not the far west right. side. And so that's not what was going on. The second thing, type of gentrification, is commercial gentrification, where basically you have one set of uh, stores who can pay more rent, replacing another set. And that certainly was, was going on in Chelsea. And actually what happened was the, uh, the meat packers uh, were paying rent, and they tended to get pushed out by actually the, the art gallery just Sure, recently. sure. Commercial gentrification, New York City Council has always refused to um, put a stop to that yeah. or regulate it. And I, I think probably on the whole, there's not much one can do about that. It's not a bad thing. It's something one needs to leave alone. And the third kind of gentrification is, is we argue, is basically where you take a, as the Bloomberg administration did, you take an area that zoned manufacturing, and then you rezone it for, say, residential and commercial. And that's what was going on in many ways in the far west side. And again, that's not a bad Certainly thing. Certainly, that at all. was the root of one of your mega projects, the, the mega, the most mega of the mega projects, which is the Hudson Yards development. Right. Talk about that development as sort of an, um, it looks like it's an emerging model or paradigm for at least New York City development and perhaps nationally and internationally. Talk about that model. Uh, it is a very, very interesting model. The Hudson Yards is the largest uh, economic development in the United States right now. And it didn't happen without a lot of careful planning. And there's a lot going on there. Uh, it's rather complicated. But basically, 
The city in 2005 and 2009 rezoned in two stages the Hudson Yards from manufacturing to residential and commercial. Okay. And uh, um, it was part of a, uh, in order for the rezoning to pass, the, um, the uh, city council and the uh, neighborhoods, the, a lot of deals were made. There was a deal made to have affordable housing there. And it was a rather complicated deal where the, um, the, there was an agreement that there would be inclusion rezoning so that if you build residential sure. buildings there, you're going to have to build some. And, and that, in a sense, has become somewhat of a model in terms of, you know, the refinery, uh, the refinery et cetera, other developments, Astoria Cove, that, that Absolutely. seems to be a model now for inclusionary zoning. Go ahead. Uh, but uh, one of the other things going on with the Hudson Yards is that uh, the far west side is a, a real desert when it comes to uh, transportation. There's no subway over there. And um, it was pretty clear that if commercial and uh, residential is going to work, you have to have a, a subway system. The city came up with this uh, terrific deal. They uh, called it uh, TIF, um, uh, Tax incre Incremental Financing, where they basi basically the city drew an area around the Hudson Yards and said, any new development after the rezoning, the taxes from whatever happens right. there right. are going to go right. to fund right. the uh, subway. And the city then issued bonds, $3 billion of bonds, and paid basically for a subway. And it's rather incredible. The subway started in 2005, and it's opening in a couple of months. And but wait a minute, but stop. But they, they didn't raise enough money through the taxes, and the city, out of the general revenue fund, had to pay for it. So, yeah, it was a good idea, but, yeah, they blew it. Well, well they there, 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 there were hiccups. I mean, I, w I would classify that as a, a, a hiccup. You're okay. absolutely right. The, 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 the city didn't, there wasn't enough development uh, happening at the time. It's very difficult to, to, to forecast that, Yeah, obviously. and so the city did, ha council did have to chip in. But if you look at the... Um, overall um, net result. We're getting a, a, a subway line over there, and uh, I, I would call those hiccups. It seems to me they're on, on, on imbalanced. But a necessary condition for West Side development. You, know, you need the, the late, late, I mean, if you don't have mass transit, forget it. Absolutely. Now, really, even now, with the extension of the 7, you really don't have a north-south on the West Side. I mean, it does move there. Ultimately, one could see something either going uptown or downtown, whether it's, you know, underground or the light high rail line. or whatever. The high line is going to work as the walking. I love it. That's a, I mean, Bicycle I'll, I'll, lane. I'll, 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 ac I'll accept that one. Another major area that you deal with and another whole arena of projects in addition to, you know, Chelsea becoming this, this art capital and mega projects like the Hudson Yards, maybe we'll have time to talk about uh, Moynihan and the, the failed Javits expansion. You talk about preservation projects and you point to, you know, the, the real successes of the High Line and the Gansevoort uh, Market uh, Historical District. Mm -hmm. But you note here that there is this, in a sense, a macro conflict between fostering urban growth while limiting growth's negative consequences and how preservation can be both a legitimate tool for vibrant organic communities as well as a tool of nimbyism. Talk about that conflict and, and how it was resolved either in those two cases or how it wasn't resolved in a case that you don't talk about. Well, Go that ahead. was evolving. That's, there's, it's a constant. You can't, you can't you know, write the, the history because it's moving. Yes, and, and being a NIMBY myself, because I live behind the Gansevoort market, of course we want to keep it the way it was. We like that gritty, low slung brick, That's the, me Belgium too. rock. We, me we too. love that. Me um, too. You need development. I would say that one of the ironies, and David will speak about this as well, is that actually the historic preservation has led to the growth of the neighborhood because of increased tourism and people want to have something that's unique. And the Gansevoort market was brilliant that Tierney decided to go along with these two activists. And because it is such a startling area with its sort of western brick um, feel. To yeah, it. I mean, I, in, in my mind, it's the most interesting. I mean, this is really, I, I, I should not say this. It's, it, it's my favorite area and the city right now between 
the High Line and, and those magnificent views and seasons, all the flowers Yeah, and we stuff. have the waterfront. And it's oh, such an man. unobstructed oh, it's, it's, view it's to the fabulous. water. And the Hudson River has been reclaimed as a Mandan Yeah, Burden, and you've got all say. those super architects developing the buildings. I mean, I don't know if I wanted, wanted, sure. wanted to live. I, a little patio there would be nice. Talk about that, though. What, what are the factors? What's the balancing act between preservation and growth or it mitigation of the impacts of growth. Go ahead. There, um, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. And one of the, what we argue in the book is there, there are a lot of different ways of uh, balancing preservation and growth. Uh, we just reject the extreme ways of doing it. The extreme ways of saying we're just going to have growth, which of course corporations would like to do. Right. Didn't stop them. Yes, or, the Dolans. Go ahead. Right. Or we, we're going to preserve everything Perhaps. and that there's some... Um, there's, there's radical preservationists who want to preserve everything. The, when it comes back to preservation, the, the lesson is basically you can't bottle up history. I mean, you can certainly try. The, the, it was very good that the Gansville Market Historic District mm. was created. But you can't bottle it up. And um, that's probably a good thing uh, because in the end, um, that area developed in ways that you couldn't have predicted. But on the whole, we're, we're pretty good for the city. So, for example, Google. Uh, who would have predicted that Google would want to move into the far west side of yeah. Manhattan? But there's no question, Google moved there because uh, you had innovative, uh, quote-unquote, preservation projects which yep. weren't really bottling up history yep. but developing it, yep. like the High Line in the Gansport Market. And Google, of course, has now led to New York becoming a leader in high tech, and you've got the whole high tech corridor going from Google all the way to Roosevelt Island and the new uh, Cornell Technique and Engineering School. And it's really exciting. I mean, I, I, I'm getting goosebumps. I mean, really, <laughs> it's really silly, but, but there's also it's ironies. interesting. The ironies are that it was zoned to keep the meat packers there, and the meat packers are going to leave. Right. Now we have, so you can't bottle up. It is always changing. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the economics is just going dr to right. drive the process. But you, you, as you suggest, it's not only economics, particularly in Chelsea. It's this this this, this an ideology of art, an appreciation of art, irrespective of the, the you know, the growing financial impact of, of art. This is the latest of the New York frontiers. This is not the last one. And you, when did you actually, this is done and they've got the page proofs. When, would, when was that? That's got to be more than a year ago, right? It was done about a year ago, and uh, one of the difficulties we, we had, we sent it to the publisher, and of course the publisher edited it, but we kept saying to the publisher, we've got to inc include this latest development. Right. Well, one of the things we take pride about is that we've uh, written about a story that's ongoing, not frozen. Right. Uh, but of course we drove the publisher crazy because we kept saying we've got to increase, in, increase adding. this and introduce that. At so what do you do? I mean, well, you've did it. it's more than a year. Has anything substantially changed in terms of either process or outcomes that if taking off from this? But the major change is we got a new mayor. <laughs> um, and um, it remains to be seen what uh, de Blasio's policies are, but th that's the major change. I okay. Well, not changes. There's one of the changes are sort of issues of private-public partnerships, and Pier 55 is a huge addition to to the west side. We're going to see how that's going to evolve, this new um, yeah. Diller, um, von Furstenberg Pier, um, and the transfer of air rights from Pier 40. It's how that's going to change it. Yeah, the waterfront so is going to be nonprofit and profit. They're they're all yeah, they're all working the, the, together. And government and, and government. And it's just all this puzzle. It, yeah, and, and high laboratory. Is almost the, yeah, and it's continually evolving. What's the? I mean, do some prediction. What's the next newest New York edge? Where uh, is it? Everyone's talking about uh, Queens. The section of yes, Queens. Queens. Uh, yes, the section of Queens just to the. Um, just to the east of the Hunter. East River. And of course, people are now talking about renaming the East River Central River because the argument is that... Um, Wait a second. Yeah, well, excuse me. Either, either Brooklyn or Queens has more population than Manhattan. Queens is hot. Yeah, and of course, Dr. Off came up with a proposal to move the Javits to... To do, to do basically another Hudson Yards, to yep. take over the rail yards over there. Yeah. And um, it's a brilliant idea. That apparently, there's just um, something like f uh, 34 acres of... Uh, Unused land. If you if you can figure out how to deck over the rail yards, and um, this is New York at its best, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it really points to the 
the dynamism of the city. I mean, is this Queens deal? I mean, look in the crystal ball. Five years from now, is anything happening in Queens? The Mets are still losing. We understand that. <laughs> but in terms of development? Not five years. <laughs> Um, Much longer time span? Um, maybe 10 or 15. Okay. There's, there's a brilliant, um, Alex Garvin has a brilliant idea for a, um, a rail, above ground rail going north south, just to the um, east of the river. Um, because really? that whole area is tremendously underdeveloped, and it's underdeveloped because just like the far west side. Are you no talking about rail there. rail or light rail? Light rail. Light wow, rail. European style light rail? Yes, and there's a proposal nice. for a gondola. Um, uh, the, the oh, Roosevelt now you're talking Island. gondolas. I mean, really? We, ah. Uh, you know, the Roosevelt Island gondola only goes from Roosevelt Island, but there's a, an entrepreneur. Are we going to do canal somewhere? Oh, why not? Um, uh, why not? Uh, you know, the the um, the city needs visionaries, and uh, I think the far west side um, b went the way it did because we had visionaries uh, and uh, innovation. The city needs visionaries. There are some times when visionaries can really make a difference, and other times. Where it's harder. The, the overall political. And sometimes context. the visionaries, their visions turn out to be monstrosities. I mean, architecturally. I mean, you do walk up Sixth Avenue every once in a while and say, no. Right? Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he agreed. Uh, My thanks to both of you, both for the book and for this conversation on land use, art really a real complex story. Again, I'm arguing for a screenplay. This is a movie. Her, their book, New York's New Edge, Contemporary Art, The High Line, and Urban Mega Projects on the Far West Side, which details the challenges of urban growth in New York City and elsewhere. Join me next week when my guest will be New York Post sports writer extraordinaire, George King III. Talking baseball, Yankee baseball, here on CUNY TV. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it. <laughs>